Previously, we've ranked the best rank 4 Xyz monsters that belong to an archetype as a way to do justice to the very heavily stacked rank 4 monsters. Today, we'll be followed up with the best rank 4 monsters that are standalone, belonging to no specific archetype, with a minor exclusion of the numbers monsters as an archetype, which is fairly overarching for the entire XC summoning mechanic. So, let's get started. And at number 10, we have Castell the Sky Blaster Musketeer. This Wing Beast monster for 2000 attack has two abilities. The first states that you can detach one material to target one face-up monster in the field, and then change it to face-down defense position. Its second effect is to detach two materials, target any face-up card in the field, and then shovel that card back into the deck. These effects are hard once per turn, and you can only use one of either of them on the same turn. Castell is one of the most important extra deck monsters ever. Its status as a completely generic utility monster that can clear the board is unrivaled amongst rank 4s. Other rank 4 removal tools existed before Castell, for instance Silent Honor Arc. This card deserves its own honorable mention on this list as a great removal rank 4 and often gets compared to Castell for having a similarly great ability to answer troublesome monsters, and even has a better second effect, but Castell's release generally reduced Honor Arc to a redundant tool in the extra deck. While both answers destruction immune monsters with your ability to shuffle away or attach the monster as a material, Castell one-ups Honor Arc and basically any generic extra deck monster before it by also being an answer to problematic back row cards. Despite Castell's limitation to face-up cards, making it not so great against reactive back row, Castell was one of the long-time best answers to problematic floodgates that loved to remain face-up. While cards like Skill Drain or Royal Oppression might hamper Castell's effect or ability to hit the field, he would be a great answer to other dangerous floodgates like Anti-Spell Fragrance or Dimensional Fissure. This ability to be useful in a wider variety of scenarios, and having a type of removal that boss monsters frequently don't have protection against, set Castell apart from basically all other easily summonable extra deck monsters up to this point until the printing of Nightmare Unicorn many years later. And being in this same conversation as Nightmare Unicorn, the most played extra deck monster since it was released, is quite the distinction for any monster. While rank 4 decks haven't seen the core meta of Yu-Gi-Oh for a while now, Castell was very good in the past, so it makes it number 10 on this list. However, with the power creep of the game, a single removal from two level 4s isn't as impactful as it once was, so the card has kind of fallen to the side to power creep, even though it used to be one of the most played extract monsters in the game. And sneaking into number 9 spot, we have number 4, Stealth Kraken. This is a water aqua monster with 1900 attack that requires two level 4 water monsters as its materials. While on the field, Stealth Kraken makes all other monsters in the field become water monsters. And as a quick effect, Stealth Kraken can destroy one water monster your opponent controls and deal damage to them equal to half its attack that it had on the field. Also, if a successfully summoned XC summon Stealth Kraken is destroyed, you can special summon a number of Stealth Kraken spawns from your extra deck equal to the number of material Stealth Kraken had on the field. Then, attach a water monster from your graveyard to each of those spawns. Stealth Kraken is one of the most unusual monsters in the game. It's not really part of any particular archetype, but it does form its own very self-contained playstyle and strategy centered around water monsters. Its first ability to make all monsters in the field water almost works as a soft floodgate, potentially affecting decks that might really need their monsters to be of a certain attribute to execute their plays. But more importantly, it makes Stealth Kraken capable of using its quick effect removal on any monster your opponent plays. Quick effect removal and a soft floodgate is great, but how about a harder floodgate? Kraken's ability to make all monsters water attribute also creates an extremely potent combination with the infamous floodgate goes in match. If your opponent isn't playing a water deck, this two card combination basically locks them into only having one face up monster in the field. And since it's a monster that Stealth Kraken can destroy at its leisure, that's pretty debilitating. Not to mention, Stealth Kraken's material costs and its own abilities already favored its user to be playing a water focused deck in the first place making goes and match just generically good and typically very one-sided. Stealth Kraken is also just plain hard to deal with, as the Stealth Kraken spawns its summons on being destroyed can special summon Kraken back from the graveyard when they get destroyed. Kraken has been involved in some water-based stun decks as a one-card control engine to back up floodgates like the aforementioned goes and match and other cards like Robber of the Warlords. But it has also seen play in other competent strategies. A more modern and dynamic deck like Marine Cess also sometimes runs Stealth Kraken, as they already have pure water archetype that can easily pull out rank 4s like Stealth Kraken with their combo capabilities. And both decks play well with the same kinds of floodgates. Stealth Kraken is an impressively strong standalone card, and serious consideration for any water deck that can access its great piece of interaction, and a very sticky threat to get on the field. And rock and rollin' at number 8, we have Gallant Granite. This is a rock earth monster with 2300 attack that has two effects. 
You can detach a material to special summon one rock monster from your hand in face down defense position, or you can detach a material to search for any rock monster from your deck and add it to your hand. Gallant Granite is one of the most specific but oddly powerful rank 4s in the game. The ability to search for any card in an entire creature type is often downright busted. Reinforcements of the army has been limited for years for making it too easy to search out low level warriors. And even extra deck searchers like Zodiac Broadbowl or MX Saber Invoker have been banned for searching low level beast warriors or warriors from your deck to your hand. And while there are other circumstances around for these cards' fates, these cards both only search level 4 or lower compared to Gallant Granite's unrestricted access to any rock monster. The real problem is, historically, rock monsters have been one of the worst monster types for a long time in Yu Gi Oh! A lot of them, like the Jar monsters, are based around flip effects, and you can see that trend reflected in Gallant Granite's worst effect to summon rocks from your hand face down. But flip effects are way too slow for modern Yu Gi Oh! Gallant Granite might have seen fringe play in the slower, early XCs format had it existed, but its release in 2019 meant it didn't immediately have a home in the fast paced environment. Rock monsters just weren't good enough to make use of this super useful search ability. That is, they weren't until Ad Emancipators arrived. Ad Emancipator is one of Yu Gi Oh!'s most powerful combo decks ever. Its ability to swarm the field with special summons, axes, powerful extra deck options that include synchros, links, and even XCs monsters was a legendary. And all of that was defined most prominently by one monster. Block Dragon. But the problem with Block Dragon and Emancipator is that the Ad Emancipators had no consistent way in their archetype to get to Block Dragon. Considering Block Dragon was so powerful, Ad Emancipator craved a way to access it no matter what. And that's where Gallant Granite comes in. Ad Emancipators had relatively easy access to rank 4s thanks to cards like Gigantes and Ad Emancipator Analyzer. Thanks to that, they would abuse Gallant Granite to access Block Dragon consistently, thus giving the deck nearly unlimited extension and an immediate plus 3 in searches after using this graveyard effect. Even when they already had access to Block Dragon, Ad Emancipator would frequently still go into Gallant Granite thanks to its ability to search for other rock extenders, like Ad Emancipators you wouldn't have cycled through yet, or even search for a powerful hand trap with Nibiru the Primal Beam to work as a last line of defense. That said, Gallant Granite's power level is directly tied to Block Dragon, who has since been banned. This has taken the wind out of the Emancipator's sails, though Gallant Granite has seen play elsewhere. It's an integral part to Megaliths who also love its ability to search Block Dragon, but still like it as it can search for any of the other Megaliths as they're all rocks. You'll even see it splash alongside Ad Emancipator Researcher as a way to search a free tuner special summon to get synchro access in the decks that otherwise don't run Ad Emancipators. Gallant Granite's real claim to fame is it made it so Block Dragon was able to be hyper consistent piece of any engine that could abuse it. It's the enabler of one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most busted advantage engines, and it really puts a ceiling on just how good any future rock monster can be, so as long as it's hanging around. And continue our elemental theme, next up at number 7 is list, we have Lightning Chidori. This is a wind monster with 1900 attack that requires two level 4 wind monsters as materials. When Chidori is XC summoned, you can target one set card your opponent controls and place it at the bottom of their deck. Then, once per turn, you can detach one XC's material from it to target one face up card your opponent controls and return it to the top of the deck. Lightning Chidori is an immensely powerful card. While the previously mentioned Castell was a generic removal tool for rank 4s, Lightning Chidori is leaps and bounds stronger as a removal effect because of its inherent capabilities to 2 for 1 as well as the ability to deal with face down cards. If Castell sets the bar, then Lightning Chidori soars over that bar for any wind deck that has access to it. And there were quite a few cable wind decks that had a history of using Lightning Chidori. Though the first deck to really make use of it was, oddly enough, a fire deck with Fire Fist. These were largely control decks who only played a small number of main deck Fire Fists, but also made great use of Reborn Tengu, a card that could easily enable Lightning Jindori with its ability to spell summon more copies of itself while being a level 4 wind monster. But it wasn't long before solid wind decks started hitting the meta. After a wave of legacy support, Harpies rose to appear to prominence and made great use of Lightning Jindori as well as later newer archetypes like Ritual Beast, Yosenjus, and most prominently in various Pendulum Magic Spectre builds. For years, any archetype that could fulfill the requirements to summon Lightning Jidori always did because it was so much more powerful than basically any other rank 4 out of the extra deck when it came to answering your opponent's threats. That said, Wind is generally one of the weakest attributes when it comes to the history of Yu-Gi-Oh!, limiting the number of truly great decks that can slot in Chidori into their extra decks. Still, it's impossible to deny how strong an immediate 2 for 1 removal effect off of an otherwise low investment extra deck monster is. While Castell might have been comparable to Nightmare Unicorn, there isn't really a modern comparison for a monster that can 2 for 1 out of the extra deck with only requiring 2 materials. At least, not one that isn't locked behind a specific archetype. Lightning Jidori is one of the best reasons to play a win deck, and packs a lot of power for rank 4 monsters. From one wind monster to another, up next to number 6 on this list is Tornado Dragon. This is a wind worm monster with 2100 attack. It has one very straightforward ability. 
you can detach one material and, as a quick effect, target one spell or trap card on the field and destroy it. Tornado Dragon doesn't have quite the versatility as a removal tool that Lightning Jidori or Castell might have due to it being solely limited to spell and trap removal. It can snipe face down cards unlike Castell, but the real important thing about Tornado Dragon is its ability to do this as a quick effect. While not as good as an Omni Negate or a generic destruction effect, the ability to disrupt plays based around continuous spell cards or field spells as well as a way to take out set traps before they can activate is a very effective form of disruption. Tornado Dragon burst on the scene just before decks like Pendulum Magician and Spirals became dominant decks of their respective formats. Popping a Pendulum Scale or a Spa Resort before they could start off their combos was a great tool, and something both decks also employed as they had rank 4 axes built into their engines. Tornado Dragon would see play for years as the best extra deck option for dealing with back row threats. The fact that it was a quick effect meant that, short of summon negating effects like Solemn Judgment, Tornado Dragon was always likely to trade positively, as any sort of removal effect to get rid of Tornado Dragon could usually be chained to and still let you get the back row removal effect off. Something even a super versatile card like Castell couldn't ensure. Tornado Dragon was one of the most played cards in basically every extra deck for years, as rank 4 access was core to most competitive decks until more recent years, and Tornado Dragon was invaluable in its utility. That said, it wasn't all just about tearing apart your opponent's back row. One of its most important utilities is Tornado Dragon was capable of destroying your own spell and trap cards on top of your opponents. This meant that, with the release of Artifact Dagda, any deck that could make a generic Link 2 and a generic Rank 4 had trivial access to Artifact Scythe being destroyed on your opponent's turn, triggering its effect and locking your opponent out of special summoning from their extra deck. While other monsters could serve this purpose, most commonly a Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, Tornado Dragon gave players an alternative route to scythe locking without having to commit to Predator Plant Verde Anaconda and all of the DP bricks. With Scythe's banning, Tornado Dragon did see a strong part of its playability go out the door, but also being an enabler that helped get a card banned is one of the best reasons to get ranked on this list. Tornado Dragon is both board-breaking utility and a critical piece of disruption for hundreds of different competitive decks over the years, handily earning its spot on this list. Following that at number 5 on this list, we have number 60, Dugar is the Timeless. This is a Fire Fiend monster with 1200 attack and defense. It can detach two materials to use one of its three effects. First, you can skip your next draw phase to draw two cards and then discard one. Second, you can skip your next main phase one to special summon one monster from your graveyard in defense position. Third, you can skip your next battle phase to double the attack of one monster you control. Dagares is one of the most versatile extract monsters ever. It provides three distinct effects, each of which has a solid number of use cases, and in the case of the first two effects, an enormous number of abuse cases. Despite being a number monster, Dagares is a relatively recently released monster, only debuting in 2019, but that hasn't stopped it from seeing play in a variety of decks. The first decks to really use Dagares to its fullest were the various danger decks like Lunalite and the Dark Warrior variants of Spiral. Both decks highly valued both of Dagares' first effects. Lunalites loved drawing two and using the discard to put Lunalite monsters in the graveyard to revive off of Lunalite Perfume or Lunalite Tiger, as well as putting Lunalite Perfume itself into the graveyard for its effect. And as you might imagine, a deck that loves special summon its monsters from the graveyard to extend its plays also was perfectly happy to take advantage of Dugar's second effect, Reborn a Monster. Spiral had nearly identical reasons to use Dugar's with Spiral Mission Rescue being a functionally similar card to Lunalite Perfume, and having monsters that could break a game wide open when placed into and special summon from the graveyard like Spiral Master Plan and Spiral Quick Fix. Tagaris enabled all sides of these setups by being capable of all three sides of these combos with drawing into the necessary combo pieces, ditching the graveyard relevant ones with its discard, or just reviving them. What's unique about Dugaris is the effects it represents are almost always saddled with incredibly heavy restrictions when placed on other cards. Often, generic Monster Reborn style effects come equipped with stipulations that might negate the summoned monsters, like with a card Living Fossil. Card draw effects might have huge downsides like preventing you from special summoning or drawing more cards, but Agaris' downsides, while steep, only have to be dealt with on the next turn, which wasn't such a big deal if you were comboing hard enough on your turn to completely shut down your opponent and secure the win regardless of missing his single draw or a main phase. Dagari's continued scene play beyond that, being another among any number of generic rank 4s to see play in decks like Dinosaur and Tier Limits, who also gained tons of values out of free discards, special summons, and could easily run out at rank 4. Dagari's has some of the most powerful effects you can possibly print on a monster, as players go to extreme lengths to even draw one card, much less two with a discard. Even Dagaris' third effect, definitely the least important and lowest power level of the abilities, gives it surprising utility as an instant OTK enabler when paired with high attack monsters. While we often refer to monsters with removal effects as the versatile utility monster of the extra deck, Dagaris is maybe the most versatile rank 4 ever, just for the incredibly distinct nature and power level of its multiple different effects. Next up at number 4 on this list, we have Bahamut Shark. 
This is a water sea serpent monster with 2600 attack that requires two level 4 water monsters as its materials. Bomb Shark can detach material to special summon a rank 3 or lower XC's monster from your extra deck, but can't attack for the rest of the turn when it activates this effect. Bahama Shark is one of the most prolific extra deck monsters for water decks since its release in 2012. It first saw tons of play for many years in the longtime competitive behemoth Mermail deck. Mermails were a water archetype that could easily summon Bahama Shark and played well with its effect. While cheating out summons from the extra deck has gotten many cards banned in the past, just look at Instant Fusion, Magical Scientist, and Guard Dragon Argapain for some of the most broken examples, Bahama Shark's strict limitation to low rank XC's monsters made it hard to abuse at first. XC's monsters often need materials to do much of anything. So while Bahama Shark could summon a number 17 Leviathan Dragon or a number 30 Acid Golem of Destruction, it really wasn't worth it without materials attached to those monsters. Mermail, on the other hand, had an archetypal monster that worked quite well with Bahama Shark in Mermail Abyss Strike. While this card did have a solid effect with materials, it also came equipped with an effect to float into another Mermail when destroyed, meaning Bahama Shark's effect now represented a lot of value instead of just another largely useless body. But what really made Bahama Shark great was its true partner in crime, Totally Awesome. As we mentioned previously in our Rank 4 video, getting access to quick effect negation was difficult to come by in Rank 4 strategies. But any water deck that could that had a rank 4 flavor to its strategy now had access to one of the best Omni Negate tools of all time with Totally Awesome. Tons of different decks threw in this 1-2 setup. Hero decks would use Elemental Hero Bubble Man's special summon ability to set up Bahama Shark alongside other generic rank 4 water monsters like 10 Goldfish. Dinosaur decks would even throw in Megalo Smasher X in the engine just to set up access to Totally Awesome. Even recent modern decks like Marine Cess or even the occasional tier limit player would include Bahamut Shark for the Toad package, with Marine Cess easily enabling it with its many level 4 water monsters, and tier limits incidentally having rank 4 water access thanks to cards like tier limit Rhino Heart and Supreme Sea Mare. Totally Awesome snatched the top spot on one of our previous lists for the best rank 2 monsters of all time, and Bahama Shark is functionally just totally awesome with another 2600 attack body thrown into the mix, making it an exceedingly powerful card so good that any deck that could even consider playing it likely does. Doesn't have number 3 on our list, we have number 41 Baguska, the terribly tired Tapir. This is an Earth Fiend monster with 2100 attack and 2000 defense. During each of your standby phases, you have to detach one material from Baguska or destroy it. If Baguska is in attack position, then your opponent cannot target with card effects or destroy it with card effects. While it's in face-up defense position, Baguska has a continuous effect to change all other face-up monsters in the field to defense position, while also negating the activated effects of monsters who are in defense position when their effects activated. Baguska is one of the cornerstone rank 4 monsters in the game. Its continuous floodgate effect gives every deck that can access rank 4 is the ability to completely shut down nearly attempt from either player to execute monster-based combos or even attempt to set up some attacks. This has affectionately earned Baguska the nickname of Plan B in the community, as if the rest of your plays fall through and you've got nothing else, Baguska's Floodgate is a great strategy to fall back on to hamper your opponent's plays once you're not in risk of hamstringing yourself. The fact that Baguska's effect is positional means it's very easy to just have the turn pass back to you after your opponent is locked down, and then just swap your Baguska to attack mode and play like normal. This makes Baguska much more one-sided than it might first appear, which is usually how all the best Floodgates function. Like many of the cards on this list, Baguska sees play in basically any strategy with a dedicated rank 4 engine built into it. So obvious decks like Lunalite and Tier Limits have a history of playing it. But Baguska's Floodgate does make it especially useful, very specifically in Link decks. Most notably, Salmigrate absolutely loves Baguska. The deck primarily relied on surgical backworld disruption and only ended on a couple Link monsters in the field at most who didn't care about Baguska. And Salmigrate could put up plenty of summons on top of the regular combos to set up rank 4 plays. This made it easy for Salmigrate to slap Plan B on the field and really lock your opponent out, and back up this Floodgate with Disruption that didn't care about your tired fiend. Baguska isn't just a Floodgate though. With the release of Zeus, Baguska gained an extra dimension of utility. Since Baguska has incredibly strong self-protection in attack mode, it was a prime Xyz monster to attack with to set up Zeus. It also didn't hurt that it forced your opponent's monsters in defense position the turn prior, meaning you usually had something easy to attack into without worrying about Baguska being destroyed by battle making it fairly easy to wipe your opponent's field with Zeus. It's hard to overstate just how strong a card like Baguska is. Outside of its vulnerability to Link monsters, it's like a more powerful combination of skill drain and stumbling stitched into a monster with solid stats and good secondary utility. It would take something incredibly format warping to really outperform this rank 4. And next up at number 2 on this list, we have Abyss Dweller. This is the Water Sea Serpent with 1700 attack. It grants all water monsters you control a 500 attack boost as long as one of its materials is also a water. 
Also, as a once per turn quick effect, you can detach a material from Abyss Dweller, and for the rest of the turn, your opponent can activate any card effects in the graveyard. Abyss Dweller is quite possibly Yu-Gi-Oh's most prolific floodgate in modern history. While other floodgates are certainly more powerful, a card like Imperial Order is banned for a reason, Abyss Dweller is at the very edge of which you can really allow in a floodgate monster without getting an express ticket on the ban list. Though it's powerful enough that it has quite a few players calling for its banning in the past. The fact that it hasn't been there has made it the most played rank 4 since its release. The graveyard is absurdly important in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! The most powerful archetypes in the history of the game to this point, Tier Limits, works entirely out of the graveyard. And as you might expect, Abyss Dweller was a mandatory inclusion in basically every deck that could play when Tier Limits were out in force. This is a common story, as basically every Tier 0 since Abyss Dweller's release had players making room for Dweller in their extra deck. The aforementioned Tier Limits usage was obvious, but Spiral was a similarly graveyard-focused deck. Zodiac had some number of graveyard effects, but wasn't incredibly reliant on it. But they still need to play Abyss Dweller in the otherwise tight extra deck because Zodiac also overlapped with the incredibly powerful that Grass Licks Greener decks. Who had a higher ceiling than Zodiac, but a timely Abyss Dweller could shut down their mini graveyard synergies? Necroz would often play it as a way to lock out two of the other competent decks in the format, Burning Abyss and Shadow, and the deck had easy rank 4 access. You might think Pendulum dominant formats might not need it since Pendulums don't go to the graveyard, but even during the short lived Pepe format, they were sliding into Abyss Dweller because they could put up so much materials, and why not stop your opponent's Perform Out Trick Clown from firing off? Abyss Dweller has been a juggernaut of a card and has made the biggest impact in the biggest formats across over a decade of Yu Gi Oh! since its release. Easy to access, powerful, one sided flaggating is often the name of the game in Yu Gi Oh! and Abyss Dweller really only comes up short to a scant few cards in the history of the game. Speaking of which, Coming as no surprise at number 1 on this list, we have number 16, Shockmaster. This is a light fairy with 2300 attack that requires 3 level 4 monsters and materials instead of the usual 2 for a rank 4. You can detach material from Shockmaster on your turn to declare one card type of the cards amongst monsters, spells, or traps. Until the end of your opponent's next turn, your opponent can't activate cards of that type if it's a spell or trap, or if you choose monsters, your opponent can activate monster effects. While Abyss Dweller's fairness is debatable, there's absolutely no debate when it comes to Shockmaster. Shockmaster is the most unfair Floodgate monster in the history of the game. While there certainly are other degenerate, format-warping Floodgate monsters on the ban list, almost all of them pale in comparison to Shockmaster for a few reasons. For one, Shockmaster can lock your opponent out of cards on their turn while activating on your turn. This massively shrinks the window of opportunity for your opponent to interact, as if they don't have a specific hand trap that can stop Shockmaster, they're locked out and there's nothing they can do about it on their turn. Cards like Forbidden Droplets, which would be a great answer to something like Abyss Dweller, is useless against Shockmaster. A fellow banned Floodgate monster like Outer Entity Azathoth, which doesn't start a chain for its effect, might be hard to interact with, but quick effect removal for the monster they have to rank up can be a realistic answer, but not with Shockmaster. Another big difference is Shockmaster locks out any option. The previously mentioned Azathoth or another monster like True King of All Calamities are unfair Floodgate boss monsters, but they only stop monsters. Shockmaster can call spells too, so even decks that are heavily reliant on spells and can usually survive the most common floodgates actively lose to Shockmaster. Trap decks might have a slightly better time as they can set their interaction pass back to the Shockmaster player, but they have to immediately answer it or they will eat a Shockmaster effect calling traps on turn 3. If all of that wasn't bad enough, Shockmaster's effect is a soft once per turn, meaning any robust enough rank 4 deck can spew out multiples of this overpowered crime against nature and lock you out of multiple card types or just ignore your first hand trap and do it all over again. Shockmaster is so obviously preposterously broken that it didn't really last long or get a chance to impact as many formats as every other card on this list. It was an overpowered monster that a deck like Windup abused pretty readily before being ushered off behind closed doors. Thankfully, never to be seen again. But it is not even a question whether or not Shockmaster would be a dominant force in the game. If Shockmaster was ever legal again, it would undoubtedly be the strongest card. And that holds true for basically every format for the last few years. Only very first turn kill heavy formats can really claim to be more degenerate than Shockmaster, because of Resolve Shockmaster is basically a first turn kill in its own right. It's just an absurd combination of being too easy to access, being too powerful, and being basically impossible to play around. Let's all just be thankful we don't have to deal with getting shock locked anymore. It's by far the best rank 4 ever that doesn't belong to a specific archetype. And its only fellow number 1 ranking peer from a previous list, Lavalval Chain, is even in the same conversation with Shockmaster for the best rank 4 monster of all time. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other rank 4 monsters you think we may have missed? Or do you have any ideas for future topics just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.